good evening, everyone. As uh, always, I'm extremely pleased uh, to be here in Zagreb. Um, what Peter and, and all the friends you mentioned have done for me, for my work in the last years, have been, has been extremely important. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, um, I want to talk to you tonight about artificial intelligence. So I will show you some images, but first I will start uh, with an introduction, general introduction. I was um, recently reading an article on artificial intelligence in a French magazine, and I was struck by the following sentence. I quote, the real front line of the 21st century lies in artificial intelligence. So I tried to, to understand why this vocabulary of the front line, which of course means war, uh, and of course this war pertains to the competition between human intelligence and cybernetic intelligence that is becoming so urgent for us today. So before I, I, I develop on this point, I would like to uh, situate my talk and tell you about what makes this competition so urgent today. So it is true that, well, like uh, still 10 years ago, we were in, uh, in an epoch that was called the epoch of weak artificial intelligence. It was a time when people said, oh, we don't have to be afraid of, of artificial intelligence because uh, never, well, artificial intelligence will never be able to compete with ours. But then two recent developments have changed this state of thing and we are now in a strong artificial intelligence epoch. So let me tell you about these two discoveries. First, the invention of new types of chips, new computational architecture by a IBM. So recently, IBM designed a totally new type of chip called neurosynaptic chip. In 2011, the Mandra Moda, the founder of IBM's computing group at IBM Research, developed with his team the first cognitive chip. The ambition was right from the start to develop low power electronic neuromorphic computers that could scale to biological levels. So the chip is called True North. It is made of 4,096 neurosynaptic cores and it is designed like a human brain. I quote from uh, this uh, engineer, Moda, he says, if we think of today's von Neumann computers, if we think of today's von Neumann computers as akin to the left brain, fast, symbolic, number crunching calculators, then True North can be li liked, likened to the right brain, slow, sensory, pattern recognizing machines. True North is designed for sensory applications that include things like artificial noses, ears, eyes, and are adaptable and can re rewire synapses based on their inputs. The synaptic chip, wh wh what is it? Why is it so amazing? Because it is made of different neurosynaptic correlates that function autonomously in a non-synchronic way so that which are not solicited remain inactive, thus resulting in a lower energy use. If it's said to mimic the brain, it is because this chip allows interactions between neurons, synapses, and axons. So it functions exactly like a human brain in it, with its plasticity. It can vary its energy, uh, vary its connections, etc. And so in a certain sense, the system develops what, we, what Moda calls its own experience. It's, it's, a, it's a chip with an experience because it, it can adapt its functioning to the context. So the first uh, important discovery in artificial intelligence is that type of, of chip. The second example is the invention of what is called today the, the invention of recurrent artificial neural networks. I don't know if you've heard of neural networks. They are computing systems inspired by the biological neural networks that constitute animal brains. So what, are, what is a neural network system is a very complicated thing. But very simply, what we can say 
is that these systems uh, work without being programmed. For example, in image recognition, they might learn to identify, to identify images that contain cats by analyzing example images that have been manually labeled as cat or not cat and using the result to identify cats in other images. Very simply, if you show these neural networks some images in the beginning, they will on their own identify other images and invent the rules of recognition as they are functioning. They, these neural networks are, are said to be able to learn. This is what we call deep learning. It means that these neural networks can learn without, as I said, being programmed. This is deep learning in artificial intelligence. So you've heard, I'm sure, about singularity. You've heard about augmented humanity, transhumanism. You've heard about the fears of the sci-fi projections that the recent development in IE are rising. So again, now that the most recent discoveries in artificial intelligence are so close to the human brain, of course, and again, the general question is how far AI will be able to go when it comes to simulate human beings. So here, I chose to deal with the central aspect of this question, like the, the comp competition between the human and the machine, which is the problem called the problem of the uncanny valley. And this is the title of my talk. So in a first moment, I will, of course, and I will show you images, explain what that is, the uncanny valley. Uh, and then I will explain to you why in the second moment and final moment of my talk, I chose to move from the uncanny to the queer, because the title of my, my talk is the queer valley. Uh, so I change a little bit the expression from uncanny to queer, and I will explain to you why. So the uncanny valley takes us into the world of robots. Because artificial intelligent, uh, intelligence and robots are not the same thing. Artificial intelligence is uh, displayed in a lot of systems, but these systems need to be incarnated in robots in order to function. So a, a major issue today for engineers is this one, very simple. Should we should we incarnate artificial intelligence system in realistic humanoid robots like these ones? Hmm? Sh do, shall we, should we give artificial intelligence the human appearance or not? So my question concerns the bodies for artificial intelligence. What, what, what appearance should we give to these uh, systems? Okay, so the concept of uncanny valley was invented by the robotics professor, the Japanese robotic professor, Masahiro Mori. And in Japanese, it is Bukimi no Tani Gensho in 1970. And the, this term was translated as uncanny valley. So when Mori invented the term uncanny valley, he was not aware that Freud, as you know, had written in 1999 an essay called The Uncanny. And it is very striking to see, and I will explain to you what it is, The Uncanny Valley in a moment, how Mori's hypothesis and Freud's hypothesis are very similar. Mori's original hypothesis states that as the appearance of a robot is made more human, some observer's emotional response to the robot becomes increasingly, increasingly positive and empathic until it reaches a point beyond which the response quickly becomes strong revulsion. So let me explain to you. So, okay, so this is moving robots. These are still robots. So the valley is this shape. So when we, when we have industrial robots that look like human but not too much, okay, we are uh, in the upper uh, side of the valley. 
then stuffed animals were even higher. There's no uncanny reaction. Humanoid robots, up to a certain point, are also okay. We tolerate this. We, we don't have this feeling of uncanniness that is creepiness. We're not afraid. And we feel a certain kind of sympathy for the robots and a certain kind of empathy. But then, when these humanoid robots look, look like humans, but not imperfectly, when they are creepy, I will show you some images, we go down inside the valley. The uncanny valley, you see, is measured is that. When, when we go down, and when the robot gives us the impression of corpses, zombies, or prostheses. Okay, so there's a point where the robot is imperfectly resembling the human and it creates uncanniness, so we are down the valley. And then, according to Mori, when the resemblance becomes perfect, then we're out of the valley again. Okay, so let me show you some uh, images of, um, uh, okay. So, according to, um, according to Mori, the problem is that we will never reach this point. Okay? So, according to him, we should not make robots looking like human beings because necessarily these robots will always be creepy and generating uh, this uncanny feeling. So, according to him, we should always have robots looking like this one. His name is Leonardo, just like you, Leo. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's a social robot, very nice. I, I didn't have the video, but he's very, very striking. He can, he can, he's artificial, artificially intelligent. He can, in, he can recognize your face, he can talk. So according to Mori, this is how robots should look like. Or this one, uh, I'm sure you have seen uh, these kinds of, of robots somewhere. According to Mori, here are the creepy robots. Huh? They are made by um, um, a very incredible engineer called uh, Ishiguro. Let me show you some. So, according to Mori, when, when we see, well, if you give this shape to a robot, it will create the uncanniness. You know? So, the, here are the creepy robots according to Mori. So, this is Ishiguro, and this is his. Uh, a uh, robotic double that he creates. By the way, I don't even know who is the real one. <laughs> and, and so, Mori argues, exactly like Freud in this text, that uncanniness is created by the fact that these robots are resembling, but they look like dead people. And he says that, exactly like Freud once again, um, we have the same feeling that when we see perfectly designed hand prostheses, that is, you know, these things that are made with silicone, elastomers, or pneumatic actuators. So when we have hand prostheses and very realistic ones, uh, I'm going to show you some others, like this one as well. See? realistic prosthesis. So again, Maury says, no, if we want to, um, to uh, domesticate artificial intelligence and to make it less frightening, less uncanny, we have to give it that kind of appearance. Otherwise, it won't never work. It, it won't ever work. Uh, artificial intelligence will never develop. So why that? Let me explain a little bit. And this is where uh, Freud is very uh, helpful on that point. It is because, uh, according to Freud, and Mori has shares exactly the same conception, um, uncanniness is created when the frontier between the animate and the inanimate, the living and the dead, becomes very porous, almost improbable. I quote Freud, the uncanniness emerges when doubt emerges as to whether an apparently inanimate object might not perhaps be inanimated, like when we touch the limit between a real person and an automaton. And Freud also 
gives the same type of examples that Maury says, impressions made on us by waxwork figures, ingeniously constructed dolls, automata, severed limbs, severed heads, a hand detached from the arm, feet that dance by themselves, etc., etc. So the problem, as you, as you understand, is that these creepy robots, or, or severed hands, etc., um, make us think of the dead. And if you remember well, the, the bottom of the valet is really when, with the zombie effect. Uh, so the, the, the robot, the humanoid robot, resembles the human, but it is not perceived as a human. It, it is perceived as an imperfectly human creature. So that's why he cannot raise sympathy and makes us more uh, think of dead people. So again, um, according to Mori, we have to limit ourselves to that type of robot. Otherwise, uh, we, we always have the uncanny valley effect. Because what is exactly, let me insist on that point, a creepy robot is perceived as a human being that cannot act in a normal way. It makes us think, a creepy robot, makes us think of paralyzed people, mentally or psychically disabled people, or even corpses, and this is of course the zombie phenomenon again. Why do we reject them? Why don't we feel empathy or sympathy for them, but uncanniness? The emotional rejection that we have is all the more strong that there are no social rules, and this is a real problem for artificial intelligence today, there are no social rules that would codify our reactions in front of a robot. We don't know how to behave in front of a robot. So we behave in front of them like we would behave in front of a zombie or a corpse. That's why we cannot help ourselves to identify them with dead people or sick people. The defenders of the Uncanny Valley theory say that, and it's very interesting as an expression, they say this Uncanny Valley is a no man's land in the literal sense of the term. So, of course, if we go back to the robots by Ishiguro, they try to really make perfect robots, but it doesn't work because as Maury says, the, the, the silicon is not, is not really convincing. So according to him, according to Maury, we won't ever be able to uh, make, to create a robot that would be perfectly human, resembling or like, likely, and to get out of the valley. So according to Maury, if we want to make a robot that looks a little bit like a human being, he says, we should use wood and not silicon anymore. So he says, if we, if we would like a prosthesis to, be, to not be uncanny, we should, we should uh, go back to wood. So that's very interesting. Shall we make a robot out of wood? Or, wood? or as he says, a Buddha-like robot. He hmm? says, if we want to have a, a, a human-like robot but not uncanny, the robot should look like a god. Hmm? So that would be a way to get out of the valley. We should have a little bit of human, but something transcending the human. And this is from a Korean extraordinary artist, Wang Zi Wang, sorry for the pronunciation, that is creating, he's creating uh, Buddha robots that are extremely fascinating. Personally, I find them more creepy than the human-like robot, but I, I'm just telling you what, what I've read. Hmm? So th the problem, again, that we have today is, um, I'm going too fast, is to, uh, 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 is, to, is to determine what kind of shape we want to give to artificial intelligence, and, and to, to not be too frightened, and to not be uh, uh, scared. So this was my, my first part, okay? So this was uh, the polemic uh, that was agitating this world. And as you can understand, there are immense economic stakes hmm, at play here. Uh, 
because of course if we find the perfect form for the robots it will sell and it will be uh, extremely profitable but this was this was a first moment in artificial intelligence but now we have another phenomenon another theory you've um, heard of um, Hansen, the creator of Sophia, the, the robot that became a citizen, that was made a citizen in uh, Saudi Arabia. Is this, um, no, it's not this one. I'll show you in a moment. And uh, there was a progress made <coughs> in robot designing. And David Hansen, the company is called Hansen Company, said, no, with me, and I will show you an example that will be the, my last image, a little film, said, with me, we will be able to produce perfectly resemblant human robots and we will break the uncanny effect. So recently he wrote an article called Upending the Uncanny Valley, like putting an end to the uncanny valley theory. He says, it is not true that human-like robots are producing this uncanny effect. Look at this he says, look at the work of this artist, Muick, David Muick. Okay. So this artist used to work for a, a robotic company as well. And he's, this is the kind of thing, the kind of uh, sculpture he's making. Okay. Extremely realistic and totally uh, out of proportion. And Hansen says, look, if, when we look at these, um, this is Sophia that Hansen also makes. And I, I want to go back. Okay. He says, when we look at these uh, uh, sculptures, we don't have, according to Hansen, we don't have this uncanny effect. So we can perfectly imagine that we have the very realistic effect without having the uncanniness. This is what he thinks. So he says the uncanny valley is not a real problem. Because when we look at the, at the sculptures uh, of Muke, even when they look like dead people, we look at them in a certain way. They are perhaps not very attractive, but they are not producing this effect of uh, disgust. Hmm? So he says it is perfectly possible to invent a very realistic type of robot without producing this effect. And he says that conversely, we perfectly, um, how do you have the, the film? Sorry. We, we, we can, on the contrary, have animal robots that are creepy and uncanny. Let me show you um, this one. I'm not very good at that. Okay, I'm sh going to show you this one. Is it too loud? Um, sorry. <sighs> Let me go back to my images. Um, so the argument developed by Hansen is that we can perfectly invert what Maurice says and argue that realistic figures are not creepy and uh, artificial or animal robots are creepy. So we have to, to find a new theory, to invent a new theory 
um, that is not the one of the uncanny valley. And he argues that yes, in the years to come, we have to invent perfectly human-like robots, and this is Sophia. And this is the uh, Sophia is able to. Uh, to, to speak, to answer questions, and she has a facial expressions, etc. Et I will show you, as I said, my last little uh, sh uh, film will be a robot cr created by Hansen, and you, you will see him speak. So, he says, um, people may find a robot strange, but not necessarily frightening. And uh, he says the valley, the concept of the valley, is not essential. It may happen, it may also not happen. So we should not base our uh, production of robots on this, uh, on this uh, notion. He says what we have to do is that we really have to give social intelligence. You know, social robots are this kind of robots, a robot able to, to speak and to, and to act intelligently. We, we really have to give social robots a perfect human form. This is his theory. So how can we do that? And this is uh, one of the may, most important challenges for ro robotics today. We have to make them beautiful. Okay, so, so this is this notion of beauty. Hmm? Um, and we have, and this is why he's inspired by Ron Mukes, uh, sculptures, we have to to put some art in 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 the in the fabrication of robots. This is what he calls the path of engagement. We we have to leave the valley and walk on what he calls the path of engagement. The path of engagement means the path of moral engagement, which means that we are we robots. Uh, makers, we have to be c morally committed to the public, to the audience. It means that we have to, our robots must attain some level of integrated social responsivity with what he calls aesthetic refinement, and these robots should comfort people. They should not frighten them, they should comfort them. Um, Okay, so th according to him, this is what Sophia is supposed to do. Sophia is supposed to be comforting. I say, uh, so of course, Sophia retains a little bit of the, of the robot, mm? but at the same time, Hansen argues that her face is perfectly human-like and, and beautiful. So we can discuss about that, but this is not my problem. No, the, the problem is uh, to uh, insist on um, the way in which now these people think of uh, this moral responsibility in creating the robots. So I'm now really coming to my, to my own point. You know, so how, do, how I react to all this. It seems to me that this discussion, like should we uh, give, what form should we give to robots? And how, um, how should artificial intelligence be incarnated, be sensitive, be, have a physical appearance? It seems to me that this discussion, resemblance, not resemblance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, avoids what has become the most urgent issue. Because as you can see, the discussion remains at the level of the body. Hmm. It remains at the level of physical appearance, body imitation, facial expression, etc., physical likeness. So, of course, this is extremely important because it is always in, a, in, a first, in the first place physical appearance that raises emotion, empathy, or on the contrary, uh, uncanniness. But it seems to me that the problem is a bit different today than at the at, at, that in Freud's time, because Freud also remained at the level of the body. As I think that the, ver the, the true question of uncanniness today 
in relation to artificial intelligence is not about physical appearance, it's about mental appearance. Uncanniness, according to me, is not that much linked with physical appearance, but with the brain, that is, with intelligence. What effect does an artificial brain, an artificial cognitive system, an artificial thinking, speaking device, rise? The essential difference between Maury's robots and Hanson robots is that the latter, like Sophia, are intelligent. And what is uncanny is not that much the face of this robot, rather than what she has in her head. I think that what makes us uncomfortable today is precisely intelligence. Hanson is right. It's true that no one today is really upset any longer with robots' physical appearance. But with robots' intelligent appearance, with their capacity to simulate human intelligence, it is the robotic mind that has become animated. All questions that we are uh, concerned with today about human-robot competition, about the threat robots represent today, the threat on management, government, responsibility, labor, pertain in a way or another to this mental dimension of robots that no one is actually questioning. What is the uncanny valley of intelligence, of the psychic effects of automatic intelligence? And it, it seems to me that even Freud had no idea of that question. Like, what is an automatic intelligence and what effect does it create on us? Because even if we don't, for example, when you, when you look at a project like the Human Brain Project in Lausanne, this is a series of boxes, black boxes. It doesn't have any physical appearance at all. Huh? It's just a series of black boxes, but these black boxes are working like a human brain. And this creates an uncanniness that has nothing to do with the physical appearance of the machine, because this machine has no real physical appearance. So it seems to me that uh, the problem is when Hansen talks about the path of engagement, it's not that much the path of engagement uh, concerning the physical appearance, but the intelligence attractivity. The question is to know whether artificial intelligence is creating a new effect of death within life, a new zombie effect, like that created by an artificial hand. What exactly is the difference between an artificial hand and an artificial brain? Are we down or up the uncanny valley with the current hyper-realistic humanoid robots because of their brains and not because of their physical appearance? So I would like to, to conclude with Freud and propose that we move from uncanniness to queerness. I wonder if the reaction against simulated brains and thinking machines does not come from a repressed and still unknown and unqualified type of what I will call homoeroticism, coming from a specific sexual attraction and rejection at the same time of the mind for the mind. I will call that effect homo intelligibility. How how do we react in front of an artificial brain? It seems to me that we are both, like in uncanniness, attracted and rejected, attracted and repelled. Uh, in, this is a, and why? It's because uh, the mind looks in a kind of mirror, the mind mirrors itself in the machine, and this creates a kind of sexual, both uh, attraction and rejection, just like Freud says, it happens with an automaton, a physical automaton. According to Freud, uncanniness pertains from the fact, I quote Freud, that everything that was intended to remain secret, hidden, has come into the open. Uncanniness is always a species of the secret. Something that, that should have become, remained secret, is open and uh, shown. And for Freud, the motif of the double 
is a striking example of that type of secret. So what if AI was currently offering us a new version of such a fantasy, of a secret made public, as if our intelligence that is in our head, something that is necessarily hidden, was all of a sudden put in front of us in the open air. In an article called The Uncanny and Queer Experience, the French um, philosopher Vincent Boursel e explains, I quote, that before being published in an art as an article in 1919, after several years of theoretical elaboration, the uncanny had already been present in the text of the Ratman case in Freud in 1909. And the first time that Freud used this term uncanny was in reference to sexual desire, it was not in reference to automaton, it was in reference to sexual desire and fantasy. And he, uh, Freud says that the rat man says, there were certain people, girls, who pleased me very much, and I had a very strong wish to see them naked. But in wishing this, I had an uncanny feeling as though something must happen if I thought such things, and as, and as though I must do all sorts of things to prevent it. So very clearly, the first use of the term uncanny in Freud was linked to sexuality. And another article by Nicholas Roll in 2003 suggests, I quote, that the simultaneous emergence of queer and the uncanny at the end of the 19th century po points out to an important affinity between them. So I wonder if we should not displace the problem of the uncanny when it comes to robotics from the body to the mind and ask ourselves if this new, very strange relationship that we have with artificial mind is not coming from, a, as I said, from a very a new sexual phenomenon which would be an attraction, a sexual attraction for the mind, what, what I call the homo intelligibility or homo eroticism of the mind. As if intelligence was desiring itself in a kind of homosexual kind of relationship, intelligence desiring itself in the machine, through the machine, and at the same time being ashamed of that kind of feeling because this secret should have remained hidden. What would be the steps of this new uncanny valley of intelligence? What would be these degrees in homo intelligibility? I will conclude by showing you, as I said, uh, a short video of um, so this another uh, realistic robot made by Hansen, that is uh, Philip K. Dick, Avatar. You know who Philip K. Dick is, of course, the, the creator of Blade Runner. And you will see, maybe I hope you will um, see what I mean when I say, and I hope we can discuss this point, that what is so incredible in this robot is not that much his physical appearance that is very strikingly resemblant, but the mind. So. Hi, Philip. My name is Chad. Hello, Chad. Let's chat. I live in Washington, D.C. I have two kids. Ah, uh, um, so. I like kids because we can play. And I do. As we chat, Philip's synthetic brain starts humming, building a sort of mental model of me. Facial recognition software analyzes and tracks my face. Do. As speech recognition software transcribes and sends my words to a database for a reply. Just calm down. Before long, we're in deep conversation. Do you agree with Descartes? And I think therefore I am? Do you think? A lot of humans ask me if I can make choices or is everything I do and say is programmed. The best way I can respond to that is to say that everything, humans, animals, and robots do is programmed to a degree. So how much of that is, is coming from what you've programmed it to say? It's a mix. Some, some of it's coming from knowledge on the web, some of it is written 
And as my technology improves, it is anticipated that I will be able to integrate new words that I hear and learn online and in real time. I may not get everything right, say the wrong thing and sometimes not know what to say, but every day I make progress. Pretty remarkable, huh? <laughs> wow. You're a very good looking man. Um, you're starting to overinflate my ego. But don't let me stop you. <laughs> Philip's stunning good looks comes from David's patent. Okay, so. Setting ourselves up for disappointment. Um, because these robots will disappoint us if we are looking for human connection. <laughs> I'm so bad at that. I'm sorry, I'm really escaped. They will be oh. to love us. David fears. <laughs> robots by bringing them into the human family we face a frightening okay I'm so very, thank you for your patience so you see uh, what the um, what what the, the um, engineers say is that um, Philip is made of uh, his mind is made of um, quotes by Philip K. Dick uh, by quotes by the engineer himself and that's in the course of the conversation Philip first has st st standardized answers coming from his personal library and then he is a deep learning system as I was telling you in the beginning so as the conversation goes he invents things by himself huh? he, he learns well, it is deep learning. He learns out of his own library and the process of the conversation. He has improvisation, if you want. So it is a kind of cybernetic creation, a creative machine, able to make humor, to have some funny, uh, to, to make jokes, etc., that are not programmed in the beginning. So it is a kind of picking up in the personal library and creating something. So. According to me, what is, what is uh, uncanny in, in this uh, robot, but we can have a discussion, is not that much, of course, the, the body, it is very resembling, but not uncanny, rather than what's, what exactly is happening in the artificial mind. Mm. Mm. And you see, when, when the, two, the two men are talking, like it, and the, the, the guy tells him, you're very attractive, you can see this kind of uh, uh, erotic engagement huh, that, um, that is starting to go on between, between them. And I wonder, once again, if we can talk about uh, this homo eroticism of the mind for itself. Okay? So I hope we can have a discussion. I'm sorry for all my uh, glitches and thank you very much for your attention.